The year was 1917. Like much of the rest of the world, Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada was fully embroiled in World War I. The small city served as an assembly and departure point for transatlantic convoys carrying supplies and soldiers to the war effort overseas. Because of its large natural harbor, the small city was quickly evolving into a world-class port and a major base for naval operations. The morning of December 6 was going to change everything. What happened next became one of the greatest maritime disasters ever. The SS Mont Blanc was a freighter built in Middleborough, England in 1899 and purchased by the French company Société Générale de Transport Maritime. Prior to 1917, she was what you would call a tramp steamer, carrying mixed cargoes to various ports. On Thursday morning, the 6th of December, 1917, she entered Halifax Harbor with a full cargo of a highly volatile explosives for the war effort. As she made her way through the narrows towards Bedford Basin, she was involved in a slow speed collision with a Norwegian ship, the SS Emo. A fire aboard the Mont Blanc ignited her cargo of wet and dry uh, picric acid, TNT, and gun cotton. The resulting explosion, now known as the Halifax Explosion, leveled the Richmond district of Halifax. The morning of December 6, 1917, started quietly as Haligonians went about their usual business. Children were off to school. Business people were opening their shops and offices. At approximately six minutes after 9 a.m., when school children were singing God Save the King and reciting the Lord's Prayer, and uh, busy housekeepers were heading off to the shops, a deadly miscommunication between those two ships in the harbor resulted in an explosion of cataclysmic proportions. 2,000 people were killed outright and 9,000 more were injured. The city was reduced to ruins and debris. The explosion was so great that until the nuclear bomb, it was the largest explosion ever. The SS Emo, a much larger and faster ship than the SS Mont Blanc, passed into the Narrows. She was traveling fast and was uh, too close to the Dartmouth side of the harbor when the SS Mont Blanc first spotted her. The SS Mont Blanc was not flying the regulation red flag to indicate she was carrying explosives. She signaled that she was in position in her correct channel. I should point out that this was prior to voice radio communications between ships. The SS Emo, however, signaled that she was intending to bear even further to port, that's to her left side, uh, that's, and also closer to Dartmouth, and further into the SS Mont Blanc's channel. The SS Mont Blanc signaled again that she was still intending to pass to the starboard or the right side. She was by this time very close to the Dartmouth shore and traveling dead slow. SS e Emo, however, did not swing towards Halifax as the SS Mont Blanc expected. 
she signaled instead that she was maintaining her course. SS Mont Blanc, however, wrongly saw only one course open, to swing to port towards Halifax across the bow of the SS Emo and thus pass starboard to starboard. Perhaps the ships might have passed without incident, but the SS Emo signaled to the engine room full speed astern or put the ship in reverse. The only problem is that boats don't have brakes and large ships take a long time to stop, never mind reverse. The SS Mont Blanc also indicated full speed reversed, but it was too late. Reversing her engines caused the SS Emo uh, bow to swing over to the right. That's very common on all boats that are in reverse. That was well before there were thrusters. And it struck the SS Mont Blanc, missing the TNT, but striking the picric acid stored directly beneath the drums of benzol, a form of cheap engine fuel that were sitting on deck. The impact cut a wedge in the SS Mont Blanc side and caused deadly sparks. Realizing the situation and knowing the cargo, the crew of the SS Mont Blanc immediately took to the lifeboats, screaming warnings of imminent explosions that were ignored. They rode for Dartmouth on the other side of the harbor, leaving the now furiously burning ship to drift towards Halifax. The SS Mont Blanc slid by a Halifax pier, getting close enough to set it ablaze. Members of the Halifax Fire Department responded, and firefighters were connecting up to the nearest hydrant when the SS Mont Blanc disintegrated in a blinding flash of white light, creating the biggest man-made explosion before the nuclear age. It was 9.05 a.m. Considering Halifax's darkest day, the sheer magnitude of the traumatic event left a lasting impression on the city and its residents. The tragedy bred countless stories of courage and hope that, in many ways, shaped what Halifax has become today. Because the Mont Blanc's crew abandoned ship before the explosion, all survived, except for one sailor who died from loss of blood after being hit from debris from the blast. Mont Blanc's captain, Aimé de Medec, and pilot Francis McKee were blamed for the collision by a judicial inquiry and subsequently charged with manslaughter and criminal negligence at a preliminary hearing in February and March of 1918. That said, from my understanding, I believe the SS Emo was mostly to blame because they were not in the channel. However, the charges against the captain and the pilot at the preliminary hearing were dropped after Judge Benjamin Russell a Nova Scotia Supreme Court Justice determined that there was no substantial evidence to support these charges. Now, according to the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, more than 2,000 people were killed, 12,000 buildings were severely damaged in the explosion, 1,630 were completely destroyed, 6,000 people were made homeless, and the homes of many thousands more needed major repairs and winter was already upon them. Almost every building in Halifax had some damage and there wasn't enough glass in the whole of the Maritimes to replace the jagged holes that had once been windows. That would take months. At the disaster site, 
the supply system for the war had taken a heavy body blow and the heart of a major business and industrial area was totally in rubble. And that's the way it was on December 6, 1917. I'm Alan Stokel. Thank you very much for watching. Please give me a thumbs up.